Hello and a very warm welcome once again to Brooks TV with me, Sam Swinnison. And me, Beth Evans. Now, global warming and energy saving is something we hear about each and every day. What, but, now, but what is being done to combat it? Well, nuclear fusion seems to be one answer. Adam French took a trip down to this nuclear reactor to show us more. I'm here at the Cullum Centre for Fusion Energy, where the place is literally buzzing with, well, energy. The CCFE is the base for the UK's fusion research programme, an effort to make fusion fuel the energy of the future. It houses the famous jet tokamak. Essentially, this is a ring-shaped magnetic chamber capable of producing the 150 million degrees Celsius needed to sufficiently heat up the elements that produce fusion energy. The jet facilities are collectively used by all European fusion laboratories. About 350 scientists from Europe, plus more from around the globe, participate in jet experiments each year. The centre in Cullum is responsible for the operation of these facilities via a contract between the European Commission and the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority. We spoke to scientist Ava Bellonahi to discover exactly what goes on. Fusion is the, what fuels stars, including our sun. And what we are trying basically to do is recreate the sun on Earth. So we are slamming uh, atomic nuclei into each other, the very, very high temperatures, like 200 million degrees, and we confine it in, uh, in magnetic chambers. And this is how we create fusion here on Earth. So the Cullum Center for Fusion Energy, CCFE, is UK's national laboratory for fusion research based here in Oxfordshire. And it hosts two experiments, MAST, the Mega Spherical Tokamak, that is the UK's own experiment, and the UK's future research is centered on. The other one is JET, the Joint European Torus, and this is the largest magnetic fusion experiment in the world. This is run uh, in collaboration with the member states of the European Union. The world needs new, cleaner ways to supply our increasing energy demand as concerns grow over climate change and declining supplies of fossil fuels. Power stations using fusion would have a number of advantages. In this age of global warming and constant energy waste, a clean alternative to fossil fuels has to be reached, and fast. For Brooks TV, I'm Adam French. Now, Oxford Brooks University is attempting to reach out to its international population. Here's Lewis Lynn to show you how. Oxford Brooks University is a well-known university that accepts a lot of international students every year. As Brooks is not the only university that's trying to reach more students from around the world, this year they came up with a new way to draw the attention of students from different countries by translating the Brooks website into different languages. Um, the first website that we decided that we'd like to translate was um, Japanese. And one of the reasons for that is that most of the students who come to Oxford Brooks from Japan come and do something called a year abroad. And particularly, although the students' English is often really, really good, maybe their families haven't had the same experience of speaking English, and obviously the parents sending you know, their children over here to study in a university, it's quite a big thing. So of course, once we had a Japanese website, we had our agents around the world and our international offices who travel overseas, meeting students, saying, oh, we'd love one in Taiwan, could you do one for us? So we thought, yes, we'll do one in Taiwan. And then Thailand, we had a request, it would be much better if we could have that information you know, for, for the Thai market. Um, and then the most recent one that we've done is the Russian one. So we thought it would be really helpful for the students and, and particularly for their parents who might not have particularly good English to be able to read all about the university in their own language. So, so that's how it happens and we produce um, the HTML web templates with all the Brooks branding which you've probably seen all around the building, the lovely colours. Um, and then we give them the information in English and, and then they're translated you know, quite often by the agents in the country. They'll translate them for us. So hopefully it's making it a bit more helpful for our international students to find out why they'd like to come here. I've asked a few students about their thoughts on the translated website. 
I think it's a great idea because Oxford Brooks has been known to have many international students. I think it will definitely help because there are tons of international students in Oxford, so yeah. Yeah, I think it's good if you translate the page, but there could be translation problems because translation can't be like 100% accurate, but to some extent it could help the international students. The Brooks website is currently translated into Russian, Japanese, Thai, and Chinese. They have planned it to translate it into more different language for students from around the world. I'm Louis Lin, Brooks TV News. Now it's good news for home owners, as reports are suggesting that property prices are on the rise. Ed Stanton reports. Oxford has grown in both size and population over the years and is now home to over 150,000 people. Over the last 12 months or so, the city has seen a 6 to 10% increase in residential property prices. We talked to Tom Broad, a mortgage consultant from Connell's Estate Agents, to find out why. Supply is, is limited in Oxford. Um, we've, we've got this, this ring road which is very, very limited. There's no more space in there. Um, they're not building any more houses. There's not a great deal of, uh, of space to build more houses. Um, so. Consequently, that's a large part of what's driving up the prices as well. You know, um, there's just physically not enough houses for the amount of people that, that want to live here. Property is big business in the UK and house prices are on the rise, with a 5.5% increase in housing prices in December 2013 compared with a year earlier. Landowners are attempting to develop plots of land or extend already existing properties, although planning permission is often hard to acquire. We asked Tom for his opinion on which direction the Oxford property market is heading. The way that the market is in Oxford, as it goes up and gets more expensive, um, we never really saw much of a dip through the recession, not, not dramatically, like some areas in the country anyway. Um, and any house that you've got, if you're struggling to sell it at X price, it's very, very easy then to rent it out and, and get a really good return on it. So a lot of homeowners will, will become first-time landlords or, or become um, almost accidental landlords because that's the that's the best market that they've got available to them so I would anticipate the house prices will remain and continue to grow um, over this next 12 months and, and hopefully over the next couple of years as well. With property prices on the rise and no more room within the ring road for new builds there's never been a better time to be an Oxford homeowner. My name is Edward Stanton for Brooks TV. Back to the studio. Now, a campaign for a stadium. Oxford Speedway has been under threat of demolition. Adam French reports. Plans to demolish Oxford Stadium to make way for 220 homes have been unanimously rejected. Galliard Homes wants to build 220 homes on the former Greyhound Stadium and Speedway track in Sandy Lane. Oxford City Council originally bought the stadium in 1975 with the intention of redeveloping the site for housing. This was met, however, with strong public opposition, leading the council to rethink their plans. Campaigners against the demolition of the site claimed the 75 years of history behind Oxford Stadium shouldn't have to end and that the facility could have a viable future if it is run properly. Proprietor of Karting Oxford here at the stadium, Andy Cooper, gave us his views on the matter. The only reason that I can see that he wants to pull down the building is to hold a gun to the council's head and say, look, there's a barren site there, let us build houses on it. Now I can't see no reason to pull this down. You know, it's, it's a perfectly good facility. It's some of the best um, stadia in the country over there, just running to rack and ruin simply because it's not being used. And uh, the big, big problem here is, is once it's disappeared, it will never be replaced. It's a facility that's, you know, just going to disappear, be a little bit of history and uh, everybody loses. The Oxford Speedway has long been a memorable part of the community holding different events such as greyhound racing, speedway racing and is the home of the Oxford Cheetahs speedway racing team. Uh, I would love the government to invest more money and make it a little bit be better because it's, it's looking like it's a little bit let down. Well, bring the dogs back to the area obviously, um, some good betting you know, a bit more uh, jobs to the community, etc. Be all right. Well, over the years, um, it's been a very popular um, pastime. To put it into perspective, um, in a 12-month period, when Speedway and Greyhound Racing were 
operating here, I should think the footfall through the door was greater than what it is at the Kassam Football Stadium. That's because there's more than one dog race meet in a week. When you had the Speedway, you'd have a different group of people. And it also, dog racing went on for 12 months a year, whereas football only lasts nine months a year. Recent plans were set to demolish the stadium, but these were rejected and the stadium is here to stay. Summer beer festivals are always popular in Oxford. That's right. However, a pub in Abingdon has recently held a wintry beer festival. Ed Templer went to enjoy the festivities. This weekend saw the Kingshead and Bell pub host its fifth annual charity winter beer festival. The Abingdon pub, which is also celebrating its fifth year since opening, was offering up a selection of unusual ales with the headline attraction of a chocolate and vanilla stout. But there were plenty of others, including Seven Seas, made from seven types of hop and a number of guest ales from local breweries. Barman Simon Rowland was able to tell us more. The beers, we got a range of 12 keg, no, kegs cast beers, starting from, from dark ones like a chocolate style or porters to low down of like traditional IPAs or like red amber, like hoppy you know, traditional beers, as well as we've got a selection of two cake beers which are coincide to try and get all the lager drinkers to come and try something different so they have like the same texture and same consistency as well as we have four real ciders on there as well. The festival seemed to be proving popular with the locals. Yeah, well look, obviously being a real ale drinker um, I'm keen on beer festivals. I like the beer festival. Anywhere that serves good beer, I will go and have a drink. In addition to the great beer, there was also classic music from the Abingdon Folk Group, made up of volunteers of all ages, which made for a warm and welcoming atmosphere. The King's Head and Bell staff also elected to donate 10p per pint, sold to the charity Action for Children in Conflict, a charity they feel provides important and relevant work in the light of the crisis in Syria. Ed Templer, reporting for BTV News. Join us after the break. Don't go away. Welcome back to Brooks TV. Now, Sam, I heard that you had the pleasure of talking to an up-and-coming local singer-songwriter. Yes, that's right, Beth. Well, I'm jealous because I'm a big fan and would have loved to have had a chat. Let's see what he had to say. I'm joined here by Alex Lanyon. Alex, thank you for joining us. Nice to meet you, Sam. So, Alex, would you like to talk to us about who you are? Yeah, my name's Alex Lanyon. I'm a singer-songwriter by trade. Okay. Um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a musician. That's what I do, really, yeah. I see, and uh, most of your friends know you for playing the guitar? Yeah, the guitar and the piano. Those are my main instruments, and singing, of course. I see. So, um, there's, a, there's a story going around that uh, you are on your way to America to tour with someone famous. Would you like to tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, well, um, basically, I, I, I play a lot of gigs at the O2 Academy. I get local support um, at the O2 Academy in Oxford. And I got this amazing opportunity to play on a Tyler Hilton show. Tyler Hilton is a one. He's in the show One Tree Hill. He's he's one of the main characters, and I was like, oh, this is an amazing opportunity. This is so cool because I've I've was listening to Tyler Hilton's album Forget the Storm like last year, and I, you know, through listening to it, I, I sort of got a feel for it on most instruments, and I remember having this whole plan. I was like, I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to say, Tyler, please, can I? play with you on stage maybe, we'll, like, we'll see what happens, and I bottled it, I bottled it. And then at the end of the show, I went up to him and I was like, so I was gonna tell, I was gonna say, can I play on your show, like play on your, another gig maybe? And he's such a lovely guy, you know, such a lovely guy. She said, oh, what are you doing on Wednesday? We're in Manchester. So I, you know, Wednesday, I drove, I drove up three hours to Manchester, just, you know, hoping for the best, but, you know, planning for the worst. It went so well. I, I, I got there and we played through, like he thought we were going to play through a couple of songs. And before we knew it, we, we'd played the entire set. And 
you know, he took us out for Chinese, me, like me and a couple of friends went out, they took their revision with him anyway. Um, we went for a meal and he was just like, you know, you've travelled all this way, would you like to play your own set? I was like, go on, and I did, br- I did bring my CD just in case, <laughs> so prepared. And then I, you know, I ended up on tour with Tyler Hilton and it was really cool. And we kept in touch, you know, with texting and emailing. Um, there, you know, there are, it's not quite confirmed just yet, the America thing, um, but it's on the cards. So we'll see, we shall see. So soon to be touring in America then. Yeah. Um, how are things with Alex Lanyon? How um, are the albums and the EPs going? What's next for, for you? They're going really well. Um, I have an EP out called Lonely Boy. Woe is me. <laughs> um, it's, it's going really well. The sales are going really well. I'm really happy with them. Um, it's available on iTunes as well. And those sales are going really well. Um, but I'm actually writing a brand new EP as well. Um, called Lions. I'm really excited to get that out there. Um, I just want to make people dance with this one. You know? <laughs> it's just like, I like to dance to songs. I like that kind of vibe. I'm really into that. I'm into a lot of like hip hop at the moment as well. You know, you, you'll hear that in there. Um, not really, but uh, no, it's, it's going to be fun. Um, and I'm actually going to launch it at my O2 Academy headline gig, O2 Academy 2, but still. O2 Academy headline gig um, in Oxford. Which when is the uh, O2 Academy gig? This is May the 10th. I see. It's a Saturday. Keep it free. <laughs> uh, yeah, no excuses. It's a weekend. Um, day after my birthday as well. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be a big one. I've got, I've got support from Empty White Circles, a local, local lads. Amazing band. It's going to be great. It's going to be such a laugh. And I'm going... I usually play on my own as a, you know, with, on the guitar, on the piano, but I'm going to be there with my, like, with a full band this time, you know, just, it's going to be great. Cool. Alex Lanyon, thank you very much. No worries. Thank you. Now, London Welsh Rugby Club are moving stadiums from the Cassam in Oxford to the Polythene in Whitney. David Holmes reports on the exciting times ahead. Since September 2012, London Welsh Rugby Club have played their home matches at Oxford United's Casham Stadium. However, things could soon change. The club are seeking a move away from their home grounds to a new home where they can generate revenue and their own income from match and non-match day activities. Plans are now in place to move 60 miles across the county to Whitney Town's old football ground, leaving the Casham Stadium as early as the beginning of next season. The club plan to upgrade the Polythene Stadium here in Whitney, developing it into a 10,000 capacity ground. West Oxfordshire District Council recently approved the club's improvement plans. I think it will bring people in um, from all over the country. I think it's a good thing, like overall. Um, it's always good to get a little bit of interest in Whitney Town. For the meantime, the club will focus on achieving promotion back to the Premiership at the first time of asking and establishing a fan base in Oxford. David Holmes, Brooks TV. Staying with sports, Beth, do you know anything about American football? All I really know is that there's lots of men running around in tight trousers. <laughs> <laughs> well, Oxford Brooks Panthers recently squared up against the Reading Knights in a fiery match. Jim Demharter braved the cold weather to catch up with the squad. Coming from a derby win against Oxford Lancers, the Oxford Panthers are facing today the Reading Knights. A win will be a terrific result for the promising Panther squad as they are trying to make it to the playoffs this season. The match started off slow, with both sides having a good defense. The Reading Knights scored their first touchdown in the opening quarter of the game, but missed the field kick, leaving them one point short. The Brooks Panthers kept their fighting spirits high. They eventually earned a touchdown that brings the score even, which followed by a field goal that gave the Panthers the lead. With the Panthers leading, hope rests on the defensive team to hold off the Knights as they begin to make multiple tries to stay in the game. The halftime ended with the two touchdowns from each team, with the Panthers leading with only one point. The Knights started strong on the second half, pressuring the Panthers by pushing them into their 20-yard line. In the third quarter, the Panthers strike back with another touchdown after intercepting the pass from Reading to increase the overall lead. 
In the final quarter, the Knights are struggling to catch up with the home team, which led the Panthers to secure the win with a final touchdown. Uh, well, it was, it was a close game for the first uh, for the first half, but I think we we kept chipping away. Reading took the lead early uh, in the first quarter, but then we <coughs> kind of took control of the game really, and we scored uh, scored three more times and uh, uh, finished up 21-6, which was a fair reflection uh, on the on the game. In a game like this, it's always a balance. Your defence will keep you in a game, um, and then especially when the weather's as bad as this, you need your offence to do something special every now and again. So I suppose if you're looking at the difference, your defence needs to do it every play repeatedly, and then you just look for something. You know, uh, the, the offence only needs three or four special plays, and that's uh, that can be enough to win the game. But we had a lot of backups playing on both sides of the ball, um, and uh, and everyone stood up and, and was counted when they needed to be so I'm, I'm super proud of, uh, of the entire team uh, yeah it was uh, it was a good game we won um, uh, Reading are like they're, they're a good team they're, they they used to be our varsity before um, Oxford but so they, they're quite they're quite high up on the table um, and with the weather it's so it was so bad it was windy and everything and ball was bouncing up and down everywhere but um, it was good to get the win though American football covers a wide variety of positions so we have you know, the big and slower guys, as you like to think, uh, and the small, quick guys. There's, there's a position for most people. Um, if you wanted to, you know, be part of our team, a part of American football, you just, you've got to enjoy the sport. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty varied sport. Uh, not many people know about it. So the only pe reason people would leave the team is if they just don't enjoy it. I mean, you don't need to be a specific type of athlete, in my opinion, to be, to be playing, to be honest. Reporting, Jim Dimharter for Brooks TV News. That's it for this week. Remember, you can rewatch this episode and all of our previous episodes at our website. Or to get in touch with us, email brookstv at brooks.ac.uk. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. Goodbye.